we're going to talk about tides. And this is something that should be interesting or useful to know for people who live on an island. Um, so if you've ever wondered why we have low tide and high tide, this is to talk about physically what's going on. So if this is the earth, and we'll do it as a top down view. And we have the moon orbiting and I'll do it at four different places. So when the moon is here, so we'll maybe start at position one. If we look at the gravitational force that this part of the earth is feeling and this part is feeling, you can draw your different force vectors. And so for example, if this is the rate, some radius A, and this is some radius B, you'll see that these forces are acting in different directions and they have different magnitudes, right? Because the gravitational force goes as one over R squared, so because RB is greater than RA, then the force of gravity up at the, this top part of the Earth would be less than the gravitational force at the side part of the Earth. And so if you were to do this kind of thing over each of the different points on the surface of the Earth, what you'll end up with is a force diagram where the parts where the moon is farthest away are from, how would I say this? I guess these parts that are not directly in line with the moon are going to have some net force that's going to be kind of squishing them into the middle. And then these other forces are going to be stretching the earth, or yeah, stretching the earth out a little bit. So uh, you've got a kind of a squish and then a stretch of the earth uh, due to the moon's tidal forces. So if we wanted to do the derivation for all of this, uh, the map and the geometry can get a little bit tricky. Um, but the, the end result is that the tidal force is 2G. And then I'm going to call this maybe delta R over R cubed. So this delta R is the uh, and maybe R is not a good call it delta X, I guess. So this delta X is the length or diameter of the object feeling the tidal force. Okay. 
and this r cubed is just the distance to or distance between the two objects. And so conceptually, a couple things to notice is that this tidal force goes as R cubed, one over R cubed. And so it's a weaker force when you just compare it to the gravitational force. So the way I've drawn this picture is highly exaggerated um, compared to what is actually happening uh, to the Earth when the moon is exerting its tidal forces. And you'll see an example of how you work this kind of problem in the Thursday uh, problem set. Okay, so this is the tidal force when the moon is at this point on the earth or in this configuration. But as the earth rotates, a different side of the earth will be facing the moon. And so uh, you'll have a, like for example, when the moon is directly above St. Thomas, then it'll be drawn like this, but then as the earth rotates, we're no longer facing the moon. And so eventually we would end up at a situation where now, so if St. Thomas started out here, eventually we're gonna end up, uh, over here, And so now the moon is, is not directly over us. And so now instead of us being stretched out, now we're compressed a little bit. So at this point, you get your high tides. And at this point, you get your low tides. And so the, the fact that we have a moon that's fairly big and that we're rotating is what is causing the tides on Earth. So, and by tides, of course, I'm meaning the ocean high tides and low tides. Now, the reason why the tides aren't exactly uh, on a 12 hour cycle is because not only is the Earth rotating, but the moon is orbiting the Earth. So at different times of like, the moon won't always be directly above St. Thomas at whatever time of day. So as the earth rotates, the moon is also orbiting the earth. And so you have a, a less than exactly 12 hour period of your tides. Okay. So any questions about this? So then the next thing to talk about is Kepler's laws. And so these deal with the uh, these describe the orbit of the planets. So And the one that I want to highlight here is uh, a mathematical one. So, and it, it deals with the relationship between the period of the orbit of the object and the distance it is away from the sun. So 
this is capital T is the period and R is the distance from the sun. So if we had our picture, so remember the sun is the center of the solar system and the earth is orbiting the sun. So this distance between the earth and the sun will be R and either by, if we know one of these, we can calculate the other. This symbol in the middle just means proportional to. And so when Kepler was uh, writing down these laws, he didn't know, he came before Newton. So he didn't know about Newtonian gravity. So he, he discovered this relationship, but he wasn't, he didn't have the physics to uh, say why this relationship was true. So then Newton came along and developed a, an entire mathematical and physical framework to describe this. And so we'll show that derivation now. So if we start with our gravitational force, and if we remember things that are uh, going in a circle, they have some centripetal acceleration. And we also remember that, and so this is kind of just stating Newton's second law, or Newton, yeah, Newton's second law, where the only force acting on the object is gravity. And then on the right hand side, instead of just writing MA, I'm writing uh, a special type of acceleration because we know this thing is moving in a circle. We also remember from last time that we said that the centripetal acceleration is equal to the tangential velocity squared over R. So if we plug in our definition for Newtonian gravity, and then our definition for centripetal acceleration. Oh, and this M would be the mass of the earth. Then we see that we get the mass of whatever is orbiting doesn't matter. And then one of these radiuses, radii will cancel. So we have G M sun equals PT squared plus side is over R. Now, if we think about something that's going in a circle, if we know the radius, then we can calculate the distance that this thing would travel if it went around one orbit. And that distance would just be the circumference, which is two pi, two pi r. Then if we measure the amount of time that it took to do one of these complete circles, uh, we could measure that and call that the period T, capital T. And so the period is just the time to complete one orbit where the orbit is just one complete circle.
So we have a distance and a time. So if we wrote, we know our velocity is a change in distance over change in time. So our change in distance is just our circumference and our time is the period. So if we plug that into the right-hand side of our equation, we get G M sun over R equals C squared over T squared. The circumference squared would be two pi r squared. And so if we solve this for t or get t squared by itself, it would look like this, t squared. So we would multiply t squared to the other side and then move the gm sun over r to the other side. And you would get something that looks like this, eight pi squared r cubed over g m sun. And so if you remember that uh, equation that we had before where we said that the period squared is proportional to the radius of the orbit cubed, then we have that same relationship here. And now a pi squared over g m sun is just some constant that you can calculate. And so uh, Kepler figured all this out without knowing any of this physics, just by looking at his data. And he calculated what this, uh, constant was, and then Newton came along with this mathematical and physical formulation and was able to derive theoretically what that constant was, and then you can compare what was measured to uh, what you would calculate. 